You'll probably have noticed that when Matt and I were riding the KOM Challenge out in Taiwan, we were on some pretty special bikes. The frames, Factor O2s, are made just 100 kilometers or so from the finish line. And so while we were in the neighborhood, we were lucky enough to go and meet the brand and see how the frames are made. And there is one particularly interesting thing about them, other than the products, of course. The owner of Factor used to make bikes for other people. He owned a carbon factory, and now he makes his own bikes. The Taichung Industrial Estate, a very important place in the bike industry. There's literally hundreds of brands located within just a couple of square kilometers of this very place. It's like the engine room of the cycling world. The Factor are just there. Let's meet some faces. Rob Jatelis, the owner. Inigo Gisbert, head of design. And also a familiar face, David Miller. David, perhaps you better explain to start with about what your links to Factor are and then also what you're doing in Taiwan. Um, Factor came about when I stopped racing. I was contacted by Baden Cook, who just uh, started to have this kind of crazy idea of starting this company with, with Rob. And I was actually Rob, who I then met quickly after, it's not long afterwards, who, who kind of actually really sold the idea to me of, of being involved and helping them develop bikes. And, and it's something that I'd never done before because even as a professional cyclist, we don't really have any say whatsoever in bikes, which sounds bonkers, but it's true. And I realized with Rob, who actually owns a factory, which is where we're at, I mean, it was opened up the possibilities of doing something that I'd never been able to do before, which has been great fun, actually developing bikes. Now, it's all very well getting input from professional cyclists, but somebody has to handle the design. Over to Inigo. We've joined Inigo, who is the design director here at Factor, in the R&D center, because we're going to try and get a little bit more insight into just how the concept of a bike then translates into the finished article. So, so how do you start? I mean, is it a blank sheet of paper? Well, we, uh, we have some goals. We, we discuss what kind of product we want to do. And so we have different people uh, and we have feedback from the market or things we see that uh, when we are writing that we want to do to improve for the next product. For example, this bike here, we, um, this is an evolution of the of a bike that we already have. Yeah, I'm struggling to lift this, by the way, not because it's a heavy frame, but because it's been CNC machined out of plastic, is that right? Yes, so this is a sample we make to confirm that the shape is uh, perfect as we want it. And how far down the line do you get before you actually make uh, the first prototypes out of carbon? Because presumably that's quite expensive if you have to make a mold for a prototype. Mm, well, when we make uh, um, parts out of the mold, out of carbon like this one's here, we got to be like 99% sure that the geometry is is what we want because then uh, modifying the mold is uh, very time consuming it's very expensive what we can do after we open the mold and we have this for example this handlebar it's a first carbon sample with the final mold we can improve the layup so this is all made in carbon fiber but depending how much carbon fiber you use in what orientation and what uh, type of carbon fiber you use this product can change a lot the way it rides the stiffness the weight the, um, the comfort we can tweak this uh, with our carbon engineers. Yeah, so this is the point then at which you might take the product and head over to the test lab? Yes, this is uh, exactly. It's just a short stroll to get to the test lab. Owner Rob was happy to take us through some of the tests, all of which actually give a real insight into the details of carbon layup and manufacture. Right then, Rob, I found some headwear, so I'm happy. Uh, you look good. Thanks. Yeah. Can you just briefly explain what, uh, what's going to happen? What we found was in the crashes, we would see some small cracking happening back here from many bodies falling on our bikes. Um, we tested many of our competitors' frames. We found that they had the same problem. So it wasn't something specific to factor, but it was something that we needed to overcome. So we developed this pendulum test where we are dropping this weight onto the seat stay and the goal is to have no fracture there. Um, what we found in the original bikes that we supplied to the team, with one-time strike, it was already cracked. 
Now we can go over five times striking with no cracking. And so what, what have you actually done differently to well, uh, this? What we've ride? done is we didn't really want to affect the ride characteristics of the bike as well as we didn't want to add a lot of weight. So we changed some of the carbon that we had back here, which was some very high stiffness material, to more of a ballistic type material. That ballistic type material has less tensile strength, so it didn't really affect the ride feeling at all of the bike, but it definitely absorbs the impact better. Right, so I've been told it needs to go to 90 degrees. I almost don't want to do this. This feels so wrong. Are you ready? Okay, ready. This is an ISO fatigue, or sorry, ISO impact test. What's gonna happen is the ISO test is we have a weight which drops directly onto the fork. Yeah. You're not allowed to have any fracture, any cracking, anything. Um, the standard is 22 and a half kilos and 640 millimeter drop. At factor, we actually um, increase our drop height usually by about 20% okay. um, because we don't wanna just be Passing, we want to know that we have a very, very stable, strong product. And so this is uh, simulating like, you know, ramming into a curb. At... This is basically like running into an immobile object. So okay. whether it be a curb or a wall or a car, um, yeah. something like that. And the idea here is that the fork needs to be around three times stronger than the frame. All right. Good luck, buddy. Impact. Oh my days. Now people often talk about the stiffness of a bike being stiffer equals better. And this rig behind us now, Rob, this it actually measures how stiff the bottom bracket area of the frame is, is that right? That's correct. Um, what we do is we put a load that simulates a rider, you know, pushing down on the cranks and then we're measuring the deflection of the bike. Um, and we're trying to come up with, you know, a goal again, you know, and before we ever start making a, a frame, even making the mold, we've already decided what, what that stiffness goal should be. Okay, so, so not stiffer is better then? If there's a goal, it implies there's a degree of... That, that's true. There's definitely a point of diminishing return. So a lot of times people think, oh, the as stiff as possible is better. And we know that that's not the case because maybe the bike won't track very well descending or it will be too uncomfortable to ride. So we're always looking for sort of this, um, a ratio between the head tube stiffness and the bottom bracket stiffness. And I can't really discuss what that ratio should be because that's sort of an internal uh, secret, but we're always looking to make sure that we're staying inside of that ratio. Okay, because that gives you the kind of, you know, the right feel of a bike. Exactly. Um, it also enables us to test other people's bikes and quantify. If somebody says, oh, I like this competitor's bike, we're able to actually quantify what it is that their bikes are able to achieve. And then we can compare to our, our bikes that we're building. So what we're doing here is Simon's actually has a load cell and the crank in his hand. And what that's doing is it's loading this pulley here, which is loading this solid crank. So we're not using you know, a Shimano crank or a SRAM crank. We're using solid steel parts to take away any of the variables that could go wrong. The same thing with the chain. Then what we're doing is we're actually measuring over here the deflection of the frame. So as he's putting that 105 kilos into the crank, we're actually measuring how much is the frame bending. How much is it bending, Rob? Uh, right now, it looks like about 30 millimeters. Uh, yep, 30 millimeters. So, Rob, for me, one of the most interesting things is the fact that you used to make bikes for other people, and now you make bikes for yourself. So, I'm really intrigued. Have you, have you changed anything? I know your factory now is a little bit smaller than it used to be. Um, yeah, it's quite a bit smaller. We used to have factories of over 1,000 people, and the factory facility is only about a little less than 100 right now. Now, we, we spoke earlier about this, and you, you sort of said that it, it influences the way you're actually able to design bikes when you have a, a highly skilled manufacturing it, workforce. It, it does. Um, we, we don't need to engineer as much safety margin into the frames to take, um, take up the slack, per se, of one of the workers doing something wrong. Because a lot of times you always have to be concerned, you know, is the, is the ply in exactly the right place or not? We know it's in the right place. 
so we don't have to design all of this additional overlap into the frame in order to, to ensure the good quality. Yeah, and you've been in the bike industry for, for a long time now. Over 20 years. Over yes. 20 years. And so how hands-on do you get now? Like, Well, I mean, I still know how to make a bike. Um, as in I, literally? I, I can literally go make one a lot slower than the, than the normal people, but I could actually make one. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I still, myself, I'm still very much intrigued by the products we make and I'm still very much interested in how can we always improve on something. So I work very closely with our engineering team, um, you know, just making sure we're always evolving the product. Now one of the things that, that came out from our conversation with Inigo was that uh, one of the first things to do, or not the first things, but uh, the important step is to finalize the, the outline of the bike so you can make a mold. But then once that mold is set, which is an expensive tool, you can then uh, actually influence much more about the structure of the bike from the carbon layup. Absolutely. So, I mean, the carbon layup is important as well as which materials to use and where to place those materials. We have a philosophy internally in our company about we put the waste in the garbage can. We don't put the waste in the frame. So a lot of our materials are specially cut to our frame shapes. We don't use a lot of square panels kind of thing, which you would find at most traditional factories. Just to save money, I guess. Um, to save money and to go faster, but it's really not an optimized layup. So we're really looking to optimize the layups of our frames. We've got a slight confession to make. The Carbon Factory is a short plane ride away in China. And so we actually couldn't get to the facility, unfortunately, due to visa constraints, which is frustrating to say the least. In fact, I was super keen that we got to see what goes on there as they are really proud of it. What we can do though, is go and pick up the frames fresh out of the manufacturing facility because the next step of the journey is the paint shop. Right, here we go. First glimpse of our frame. Look at that. So this has come directly from the composite facility to the paint shop. Raw carbon is a thing of beauty, isn't it? And this has already been hand finished, actually. So when it comes out of the mold, it goes through a sanding process. So we get that super, super smooth finish that is so typical and so amazing of carbon fiber. As well as that, also some of the holes for bottle bosses and also cable guides, they've been hand finished as well already and the seat clamp bolt has also been drilled out. And one of the striking things about it, you know, is that there's not a single piece of metal on here. So the headset bearings will go straight onto the carbon there. The bottom bracket bearings get pressed straight in there as well. Right, I better stop fondling it, otherwise I'm going to get it all sweaty before it gets painted. We are being let loose inside the paint shop. Oh yeah. So we've got our frame already racked up there. Now, I'm told many paint shops will spray frames in larger batches, so they'll all be racked up It'll be a much bigger place. Whereas this, we've got individual booths to do one frame at a time. Underneath, you can see there's a load of water. The idea is that that catches the overspray from the paint where it's then filtered and cleaned. So there's no environmental issue there at all. Now, to actually paint it, we first need a base coat, and then we need our color on top of that. And if we've got more than one color, which we don't have in this instance, then it will need to be masked off and then go again before being baked inside an oven to get that super hard, durable finish. Makes you think, you know, that if the UCI get rid of their weight limit, the Tour de France is gonna look pretty boring because everyone would go for a matte black raw carbon frame, because paint does obviously weigh something, but Matt and I are sacrificing a little bit of weight for style. There we go. As if by magic, a blue 54 and a 56 in Roman Bardet edition white. There we go, decals applied obviously, and then a clear coat finish over the top. And the finishing touches, so we've got our cable guides, we've got our front derailleur mount riveted on. Bottle cage bolts, look at that. One thing I have noticed is Roman Bardet's personal motto, take the risk or lose the chance, definitely something to live by, except when you're doing the KOM challenge, at which point, take the risk and die on your ass. I think it's gonna be appropriate to me, so, uh, so yes. Sorry, Roma. Not this time. Uh. 
You might have seen some black ink branding and products around the place. And let me explain. It's the sister brand of Factor, so like the component manufacturing arm. Wheels, as you can see here, bars, stems, seat posts, bottle cages. It's all made in the same facility as the frames. We will finish our tour in the packing room, but unlike this one, which is ready to go and be shipped out, mine and Matt's don't need to go in boxes. They're going to get built up right here, ready to race a 100 kilometer hill climb. At least the bikes will be ready to race. I can't exactly say the same for Matt and I. But you can see how we get on. If you subscribe to GCN first, do that, just click on the globe. But then that KOM challenge video, to get through to that one, click just down there. And to see a little bit more information about the bikes that we're racing, click just down there.